Okay, we're live. Let me just let... Get a few things set up here. Oh, nothing like being ready. And this morning was nothing like being that ready. Good morning, Makara Chandra. Glad to see you here. Lurking or otherwise. comes the raid. Get ready. Good morning, afternoon, and or evening to everybody. How is everyone doing today? Hope everybody is having a good day. Second hand, Isaac, Walking Dead Lover. Who else do we have coming in here? There's a few others lurking their way in, I can see. Well, let's get started. Um, fir first of all, the, the announcement that I've always, that I've been ho hoping to be able to make for the last couple of weeks. Uh, this will with all likelihood be the last stream that my current desktop ever gets to broadcast. Uh, Makara should be here in a bit. They went AFK. Okay. Um, yes, this, this should be the last stream this, this computer ever broadcasts. Um, my new computer case is out for delivery. It's on a truck. It will be here today. Uh, my build buddy has arranged to uh, give me some time tomorrow. So by the Thursday morning stream, I should be on my new gear. I might actually pop on um, tomorrow evening, uh, e Eastern U.S. time evening, uh, just to check things out and, and play around with a few different settings. Uh, I'm, I might get really, really creative too and... and try to change a few things around and um, go, go with a few things that I haven't been able to because of the machine. Uh, so we'll see how much time I have to play tomorrow night um, to, to prep things up, but I will I will make sure that I'm at least ready to go on Thursday morning for my scheduled stream. Yeah, I hope, I, I yeah, <laughs> secondhand I agree, I hope there's no real issues. Uh, we, we've looked through, we've opened up and looked through all the, you know, the various components and things and everything looks good. The one thing I didn't do that I probably shouldn't have, that, that I probably should have done is opened up my new monitor boxes, make sure the screens aren't cracked or anything like that, but uh, the boxes themselves looked in pretty good shape, so. So we will see how that all works. So I want to start with the typical what's becoming typical anyway. A uh, quick update on where we are in the world, in the wonderful world of Synergasia. Um, a few things have been going on. Uh, let me bring up the map. Did I just hook it up on a breadboard test board? No, I didn't. Uh, didn't do that. We we have inspect we have visually inspected everything. 
um, and have even done a quick, uh, we did a drop, a quick drop, drop into the socket check of the CPU to make sure there's no bent pins. Um, so, I mean, other than that, there's really not that much to connect. I mean, the, the CPU obviously has to be properly seated and, and, and the fan mounted on it. Um, but everything else is, is plug-in cards these days. It's, it's not that complicated. <laughs> <coughs> it's really just a matter of making sure you're properly grounded when you do everything so you don't fry something before you use it. Um, so here we are in Synergasia. Um, I have not looked this morning to see if we have any new uh, folks. I see Kahuna has been doing some rearranging because we have two rows of five instead of a bunch of rows of three now. And there is at least one new name in there. There are two new names in here. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. No, I remember ten. But I don't remember these names. That's interesting. Unless somebody requested that their name be... Uh, real, that a real name be used or something. I'll have to see what's going on with that, but... I know we have 10 people, and there's 10 people on this list, so. Four, five, six, seven. It looks like he went for the real author names instead of the uh, World Anvil names. That's possible. So, there we are. Uh, Kahuna has been hard at work taking each of the indiv individual regions off the map. Oh, the three column is still there. Oh so, oh, so he's added... Oh, I know what it is. This is the writer. Oh, that's what that's what changed. Yeah, these are the authors. Uh, once once you were put in as authors, um, the, the writing team shows up automatically. And that would use your quote-unquote real name. That's why I show up as Bob O'Brien up here, for example because um, that's how I registered with World Anvil, you know, as a, with a real name as opposed to a screen name. Um, so that's, okay, so that's why those are there, and this is this is the list that I remember. Okay, so I'm not losing my mind, and nothing has changed out from under me. That's a good thing. Um, as I was starting to say, Kahuna has been hard at work taking the world map section by section and adding more detail to the maps and I can take a quick look at those with a few folks just so you can see the kind of work he's doing. Um, in addition to that, we have, oh Isaac, thank you very much for the sub, that's greatly appreciated. Um, in addition to that, we have added to the clocks and calendars uh, first of all, I added a little phrase. Anybody who's looked through this article before yesterday, um, I added a little phrase into this first bullet point that was very important, and I don't know how I missed it, and that is the, the length of the solar year. Um, it does get mentioned over here on the sidebar, but I wanted to make it clear. Uh, but the other thing we've added is a simple master calendar. And when I say simple, we didn't, we didn't define what a week is. We didn't define what a month is. We will leave that for you folks to decide. And the sidebar and this article give you dozens of alternatives for how you can do that. Uh, the only thing we did do, though, the only thing this calendar shows you is that there are 360 days in the year. If I scroll all the way to the bottom. And we have set the moons in motion. So as you can see, for each day, you can see what the phases of the moon are. Um, the smaller red moon and the larger uh, yellow moon. And you can figure out what you want these things to mean for yourselves. So, th so that's all there now. All right. Um, so you know, what we're going to do with calendars, I'll, I'll mention this quickly for those of you who are involved or, in, or interested. Um, we, you know, if you you will be allowed to set up your own year your year timelines and your own calendars, um, we 
Kahuna and I may have to actually create them for you. It's I'm not sure, we're not sure exactly what what authors can and can't do in a world. And we know you can write articles, but I'm not sure about calendars and timelines. If we have to create them for you, we will according to your specifications. Uh, so eventually, we could have 25, you know, completely different calendars in here, and one calendar might say. A week is six days and we have 13 months and another one might say a week is eight days and we have we don't do months or you know whatever I mean that's all entirely up to you um, you could even um, somehow define your year as being I'm not I'm not sure how that would work if you tried to t define your year as being other than 360 days like if you if you went off a full lunar but we'll make it work. We'll, we'll figure out how to make that all work. Um, we did also create a timeline. Um, as you're about to see, there's really not much in it. All right. We have the beginning of Synergosia. Basically, that's today. And we've... Um, and, and anything that happened before that happened before that. So again, you will be able to create a timeline if you want to define, if you want to say that you are in year 2742 of your current era, uh, we will help build the, the timeline that, that ties into this one so that all of the different timelines, you know, so that it, you'll have access to the timelines and all of the different... Uh, Isaac says, yeah, you can't do calendars and timelines. You're only able to make the articles. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's... that. You know, that We're all kind of figuring out, too, what, what happens or what it means to be an author in a, in a multi-world here. So, uh, and, and Kahuna and I are... Kahuna and I are going to need a few things to do anyway in this world once you guys all get started. So... Um, how do you change the era of a historical event on your timeline? Um, if you've defined the eras, I mean, when you define the eras, you define certain periods of years. Um, if you have an event and it has a, an absolute time, um, you, you, know, you, have, you create a World War II event, but it isn't showing up under AD. Uh, it's probably something to do with the conversion or translation to the universal time. Um, I, I get messed up with those myself all the time. Uh, either the era is not properly defined or the event is not properly defined uh, in, in relative to UTC. Because all, all of these things, the, the timelines and eras all actually work on... The, that universal time constant, and in, in our case, by the way, for Synergosia, uh, UTC zero is today. Um, so UTC negative is um, e everything in the past, and going forward, it's it. You know, this is like I said, this is this is year one. We actually did create a. Uh, <coughs> this says zero and beyond, but we we did create a, a an AS and a, and a BS period. Um, as in after synergy and before synergy, or or after synergy and before synergy, uh, if you want to call it that. Um, but again, you folks don't need to use this timeline or those eras. We just we just had to set up a master so that all of your timelines um, have a master to refer to for as far as universal time is concerned. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll we will all together slog our way through that. I think this is going to be an excellent learning experience for lots of people, uh, including Kahuna and myself, as we as we try to make this whole thing work. Um, but it should be fun. So anyway, like I said, we so we've got that. Um, The other thing I did want to do very quickly, uh, I'm going to take a quick look. Um, people, we, we have, again, we the, the first people that have joined um, have been made authors, and they have been hard at work. Um, we have a whole bunch of, of religion articles. The, the religion template, or the religion prompt, by the way, has been kind of pre-released. Again, so that anybody that 
is an author now can get started on things. Um, but people have been busy. There's a lot of articles already started in here. I do want to check real quick the We Need You article to see if anybody new joined overnight. Um, by the way, good morning, scribe. <laughs> I answered your question. I didn't say good morning. Let's see if we have anybody new. Nope, nobody new yet. Uh, Moondare was the last one to join. So that's where we are in Synergosia. Um, Kahuna. Oh, you know what? Let's let's take a look at and see what what he's been doing with the maps. Uh, okay, the only one he's published is Region One. He hasn't published the other ones. I'll have to talk to him about that. But if we want to see what they look like. I saw some of the other ones he was doing. He's doing some nice work with these. Um, so he's 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 more clearly the, the the coastlines get more clearly defined. The mountain ranges get more clearly defined. Uh, he's throwing in some tinge, you know, some tinges of color, uh, just to make the map a little more interesting. Now again, um, these things are still subject to change according to your whim. Uh, if the owner of Region 1 decides they want to have a big lake right here, we will put the lake in. If the owner of Region 1 decides they want this whole southern peninsula to be a jungle, because there's the equator, then we will put in the appropriate coloration and or um, assets to make it look like a jungle, or a desert, or whatever. As you define cities, we will put little markers on the map to indicate where those cities are. So these maps themselves, the individual region maps, will be uh, living documents themselves. Uh, and again, this is this is part of what, what Kahuna and I will be doing. This this is where we get to play in, in, in Synergosia. We get to to keep all of the, uh, the common stuff up to date. Um, you'll notice he did throw in some, uh, some ocean... Um, What, what am I thinking? Oh, either ridges or uh, these look like ridges. Um, he's putting in ridges though and, and trenches um, to to line up with the tectonic, the, the various tectonic regions. Um, but uh, you know the, these are interesting to know because this could mean you know there could be earthquakes here and that could mean tsunamis across this coast. Um, so th so that's always a possibility and. Um, we, we're still toying with the idea, by the way, of every once in a while. I mean, not, it won't happen early, because uh, early on everybody's going to be busy just, you know, fleshing out and getting getting their world, you know, organized and built. But who knows? In a year or so, we might make an announcement that, you know, that that this ridge su suddenly had a major shift or move, and there was a tsunami that attacked, you know, and there might there might now be a prompt, you know. <laughs> You know that that says you know there was there was a tsunami here. It it has struck all of these regions. What does that do? What does that do to you? Or what impact does that does that have on you? Um, so th th those are things we've toyed with with playing. You know, with playing with. We'll we'll, we'll all be talking. Uh, when I say we all, not just Kahuna and myself, but also all of, all of the uh, authors involved, um, we'll be talking about maybe doing that sort of thing at some point in the future, just to make things fun and interesting. Uh, but that's way down, way, way, way down the road. Um, we're not going to suddenly destroy your civilization before you get to define it. So, <laughs> yeah, natural disasters. Oh yeah, we, yeah, we're talking, and and we we've already put together the list. I mean, the classic list. Anybody that's ever played The Sims uh, will recognize, you know, the classic list. I mean, we could have floods, we could have tsunamis, we could have a. Uh, one, one of the high-tech areas might have a nuclear accident that causes nuclear winter everywhere. Um, one of the, you know, there might be an asteroid strike. Um, the, the, the kaiju may rise up out of the ocean. <laughs> um, there, there's, there's lots of opportunities and possibilities for, for disasters. So, um, 
you know, but but again, that's you know that that's way down the road. Um, if 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 this if this ever starts to get boring, we have ways to uh, to make it very unboring. You know, so we'll we'll have to see how this how, how it goes. So that's basically all I have for today for Synergosia, unless anybody else has any questions um, about how things are going. Oh, Isaac Tom likes the idea of, of natural disasters, yeah. Uh, and again, that, that they'll come well after you've you've established your worlds and your cultures, and you're starting to write about, you know, some of the details and things. Um, you know, it, it, it you know, and it, and they'll take the form of, you know, the event will happen, but then we'll have to come up with a, a prompt or two to, you know, to to explain, you know, it, you know, if this has suddenly happened, what does it do to your world? You know, so. Um, yeah, absolutely. You need, yeah, you need a coastal town before we can flood it, right? You know, there, th and there's other possibilities too. There's volcanoes all over the world; they can erupt. Um, uh, earthquakes are always good. Um, you know, the <laughs> alien invasion. I don't know. We could even play with that. Maybe I don't think so. I think that's probably the least likely of all. Uh, but we did like the idea of, 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 of Godzilla uh, climbing up out of the ocean somewhere and, you know, walking through a region. <coughs> and some of these might be more, you know, might be more area than others. So we'll have to, we'll have to figure out how that works. But, uh, but we'll deal with it. So that's basically all I wanted to say about Synergosy this morning. Um, Wow, well, man managed to get through Synergosy in half an hour today. I think it took two hours the last time I started with that. Um, what I want to start working on today is something that will definitely be of interest to you RPGers, uh, but could also be of passing interest to, to the uh, creative writing group that's out there. Um, you, you wouldn't use it for the same reason, but, but it's the kind of thing that, you know, especially in fantasy world, it is the kind of thing you want to think about. And that is random encounter tables. All right. And for those of you who aren't familiar, um, most of the adventures that happen in an RPG are, are planned and laid out, you know, and I know, in a, you know we know in advance the, the characters are going to go here, and when they get there, this is what they're going to see and face. Um, but ever since the beginning of the hobby, uh, the, the concept of a chance random encounter uh, has been involved. Uh, just to keep things spiced up and to keep things moving sometimes, especially if you're running a session that is mostly travel or mostly um you know e exploratory and not you know, and there there, there aren't the, there's not an opportunity to throw dice uh, basically um but the problem the problem with random encounters has always been um th th there tend to be in in the various rule books or guidebooks um you know if 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 there's if there's any guidance at all, it usually exists in the form of a table that has in it encounters that range from very low-level creatures to very high, stupidly high-level creatures. And, and they're just literally just taken from a smattering of, of things. I mean, in, in the old D&D editions, in first and second edition, they tried to set up uh, encounters by biome uh, but even there they, they had to deal with the fact that you know y you needed 10th level creatures and first level creatures and whatever you know and and and, and it never really really it, it never worked out super well you, you almost invariably ended up with something that you on the table that you either had to re-roll or or do some heavy work to to make it um to make it usable what I would like to do in my world of Carterion uh, is is try to do some of that advanced work early, and and come up with a set of encounter tables that can be used much more quickly and easily, and and 
and much more predictably. When I say predictably, I mean the outcome of any given encounter, um, to at least to the DM, you know, would would be would be better understood. Um, a, f a few things in the way I'm setting up Carterian are going to help that. Um, the area that I'm working in now, um, the, the you know the region I've been working on, the the, the Feywood, it's kind of designed for first to third level characters. Uh, it's it's kind of the training ground. It, it it introduces the players and the characters to the world of Carterian by throwing at them, uh, at least in a forest natural setting, and throwing at them all the different kinds of things that they might possibly encounter in the rest of the world. Um, it is the most fey-rich area, but it has but it's an area that has been touched by the Great Strife two thousand years ago. So there are. Um, you know, there, there are devastated areas, there are, um, there, there, there's at least one area that involves the ruins of an ancient, um, you know, of a, of a 2,000 year old uh, civilization, city civilization that was wiped out uh, and is now 2,000 years overgrown. Um, there are, you know, the, all of the different flavory kind of things. Um, but everything is going to be is is basically tuned for first to third level. Now that doesn't mean there aren't higher level creatures living there, and eventually they might come back, and 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 I have to repopulate it a little bit. But but for now, I can focus on just the the sorts of of, of critters that th that a first to third level party uh, might might possibly encounter as they adventure in a forest that is managed essentially for the most part by elves and fae um ex except for the few areas of the, the few pocket areas you know that that were infected or polluted or or whatever uh a long time ago and have never fully recovered so i i i it, it it's a, it's more than just a biome i i you know i have i know what the region looks like and even within that there are basically three um, areas that that players you know might have encounters and and you start to see those in this little spreadsheet that I've started to set up building and today I hope to fill up a lot of uh, they could be wandering in the forest itself uh, now this means away from the road. There, there's there's basically one or two main trade roads that cut through the forest, and in fact down here we will have road encounters. We'll deal with those separately because there'll be some things on the road that they might encounter, like other people, uh, that they wouldn't necessarily encounter in the forest. All right, but basically I have a forest, I have forest encounters, and I have swamp encounters. All right, and I've I've done a lot of setup work on these. Um, anybody who is um, Excel proficient will recognize that I have thrown a lot of formulas into some of this, and you'll see how this all works in just a second. Uh, I remind everybody that this is a Pathfinder 2 based system. Uh, I would need to come up with a whole different set of uh, table calculations if I were to do this for D&D 5e. Um, and I will go through a quick explanation. I think I did this uh, last week as well, but but you know, so hopefully I'm not repetitive. But I'll do a quick recap again of how the uh, how the Pathfinder 2 system works for uh, for in, in as their replacement for what D and D five E calls challenge rating. Oh, gotta get that coffee in. So the other thing I've done in prep already is I've gone through the two uh, Beast Jerry books for Pathfinder 2e um, and identified all of the creatures that are the appropriate level for these tables um, that you might find in the forest. Now this leaves out a bunch of common things, you know, your, your basic deer and, and rabbits and things like that. Uh, which I may end up putting in, but uh, I'm not sure if I need to put them into the tables or not. But we'll, that's one of the things that we're we're all going to talk about very shortly. But anyway, I, I've pulled out of the bestiaries the 
the various forest creatures um, and the various swamp creatures. And as you can see, there are a bunch of them. Well, I don't necessarily want to have all of them in a random encounter table. Uh, what my plan is for the random encounter tables is for each one of them to just be a d20 based. Um, so I'm going to pick 20 things. Um, and I, I, I would like there to be d20 based and I'd like to be able to see um, what kind of threat or, or whatever they're going to be to various level parties. All right, and, and then from there I'll decide how I want to actually present this information uh, when, I, when I go to actually package all this stuff up for people. And, but let me show you very quickly how, how this works and what's behind the, uh, the spreadsheets. Before I do, there's, there's a couple of other lookup tables over here to show you. Here's a list of all the creatures and what levels they are and also from my reference what which whether they're in Beast Cherry 1 or 2 and what page they're on. So if I have to go look them up for details I can. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into stat blocks today. Um, these next two tables have to do with how how Pathfinder 2 does encounter planning. Alright and basically the way the way they work is um, the creatures involved in an encounter are going to be assigned an experience point value based on the difference between their level and the party's level, assuming it's a party of four characters. All right, so that's what these base numbers are. So what that basically sa what that essentially says is if I throw them a a forty experience point collection of, of, of enemies. All right, a party of four should have no trouble at all dealing with that. It should be a trivial encounter for them, which means basically it'll the fight, you know, if it's a fight, it'll be over in a round or so. They won't have to use up all their spells. They won't have to drain all their potions or whatever it is they have. Uh, this add-on column, by the way, tells me what, what to do to this if the party is not four people. Uh, a party of five, that number would become 50. A party of six, it would become 60. If it was a party of three, it would become 30. All right. so this add-on is, is, is for deviations from a party of four. Uh, moving on, if I throw 60 experience points worth of, of, of whatever at a party, um, again, shouldn't be a problem, but they're going to use a little bit more of their resources and they might take a little bit more damage. At 80, things start to get a little more worrisome. All right, all right. they'll win. Um, I mean, obviously, unless the dice go really bad, you know. But they'll win. But but it's going to cost them some of their resources. Uh, you know, a, a notable amount of their resources to get through it. At 120, we're talking about they better go in fresh, and they're probably going to come out drained. Um, but they still should, you know, they have a better than even chance of making it out. Uh, un unless, of course, they went in already drained or, or whatever. That, that could be worse. And when you get up to 160, now you're starting to get into the, the real possibility of total party kill. All right. So you don't want to do too many of those. <laughs> <coughs> you could. I mean, there there might be times when you deliberately want when you want to do that, but but you, you don't do those. I mean, you, we're not going to have random encounters that are extreme. All right, uh, random encounters are planned encounters um, that that you would have given the party an opportunity to prep up for and load up for and essentially go in go in fresh, uh, unless you want to kill off the party. Uh, so where do these experience point numbers come from in the, in the encounter? And that's this table here. Um, if a creature is the same level as, as the party, um, then it's worth 40 experience points, which, as we'll see, is a trivial encounter. So if we have a first-level party and they encounter... I'll make it real easy, and they encounter a first-level bandit on the road, 
a single first level bandit on the road, they will have no trouble at all dealing with it. If they encounter two first level bandits on the road, that would be 80 experience points. And again, they'll beat it. <coughs> all right, I mean, there's four of them and two of the bad guys, so they'll win, but it'll cost them a little. If there were three, again, they'll probably win, but it's gonna cost them a lot because you know, three against four is, is getting close to, to an even match. And if there were four on four, you know, two evenly matched, now you have two literally evenly matched, so it could go either way. Um, you know, there's a 50-50 chance the party loses this fight. Um, you know, so, so that, that's a good indication of how things work. Uh, what that also means, though, too, is, again, the creatures themselves have fixed levels. So as a party advances, all right, that, that, that group of four first-level um, bandits, you know, when the party is first level, that's an extreme encounter. But when the party is second level, it's only a severe encounter because now there, there's a level difference between the party and the bad guys. They're only 30 points each, so four of them is only 120. So now we've moved from extreme down to severe. If the party is third level, they move down again, and it's only a moderate encounter. So you can see how this works, you know, how, how these tables end up working, you know, as, as a function of the, you know, the, the, what it is we're attacking and what the, uh, with what the um, the threat level is going to ultimately be. So what I've done over here is I've set up a bunch of formulas so that if I take some but something off of this um, table, like let's say giant tick. Who doesn't want to run into a giant tick when they're walking through the forest? Right? All right, it's gone to my tables. It's found that it's level one. And it's done some comparisons. All right, if it's a level one party, then that giant tick is worth 40 experience points in the budget. 30 if it's a level two party, 20 if it's a level three. So that tells me if I have one of these for a first level party, it's a trivial encounter. And for a second or third, it's, it's not even that. All right, but if I up the count to two, now, all of a sudden, it's a moderate encounter for the first level party, low or trivial. So I can play around with these numbers to decide, well, how many ticks do I want to throw at them? All right, and it might depend on what level the party is, or, you know, if I could throw three at them, now all of a sudden, a first level party is fighting for its life. All right, and certainly if I throw four at them, it definitely will be. So this will let me gauge where I am, you know, and how many of something. Now there's some other guys down here that could really get nasty. Um, let's say I, <laughs> let's put an owl bear in here just for a minute. All right. And we see one owl, just one owl bear right off the bat is a, is, is a pretty nasty encounter. Uh, if, if these guys are, are, are asleep in their, you know, in a camp in the middle of the forest and an owlbear walks in on the camp, um, if they're a first level party, they're going to have a nasty fight on their hands. All right? And their best bet might be to just run. You know, and, and I'm not beyond putting things like that into the random encounter table, but they shouldn't be common. The other things about... Uh, random encounter tables is oh and hello by the way hello dm stretch thank you for coming the other thing about random encounter tables is that they can't or they shouldn't be all bad all right there, there should be some encounters in the table uh level one went asleep against alpha yeah just about <laughs> Depending on, you know, basically this, this fight would literally come down to whether or not the guy on watch um, detects the thing before it actually gets into the camp. If, if the guy on watch misses, 
then then they're in a lot of trouble. Um, you know, if if that owl bear gets first attack on 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 the single creature that's that's awake, then then it's going to get nasty right off the bat. Um, but but anyway, what what I was starting to say is again, not all of the encounters need to be fights. Some of these encounters, first of all, should be could be against other good things, uh, which is why, for example, I have Elf Ranger involved in here. So now, if I put Elf Ranger in, actually, it's not going to. Well, it is going to know what to do because I've set up numbers for it. I'm assuming it's a second level Ranger. So there are encounter numbers, but the idea wouldn't be to fight, well, unless uh, unless it's an evil party, or unless it's a, a party full of orcs that are out looking for rangers. Um, it, it, it's not necessarily to fight. Um, th this could be as something as simple as just, you know, they, you know, again, they're sitting in camp and, and, an, and an, elf, an elf patrol comes through because the elves do monitor the forest, so they might just come through, stop in. What what are you guys doing? You know, it could be a social encounter. Um, it could be a potentially threatening social encounter, uh, depending on the mood or the attitude of the elves. You know, we we've never seen you guys. What are you doing this deep in the forest? Where you know why why are you here? What are you hunting for? What are you doing this? What do you you know? Depending on how the party handles it, it could get nasty. Um, so. You know, but that but that's an interesting kind of, of challenge to throw at them. Uh, when we're talking about the encounters on the road, um, there will be merchants on the road, there will be farmers on the road moving their goods back and forth. There will be um, now there there could also be bandits on the road. Um, you know, and then there could be you know the odd creature that comes out of the forest um, to. Um, attack what's on the road or to deal you know to to do something with whatever's on the road so um, the, the different regions the different areas have different specific needs I would not expect to find a merchant caravan in the middle of the swamp because the swamps are nowhere near the roads so so that's so that's the plan um, you know th that that's that's what I want to try to do today is start to basically go through this list, identify the things that I would like to put on a d20 based random encounter table, which means I'll want a mix of fights and, you know, ba bad stuff, um, could go either way stuff, and um, harmless stuff. Um, but, but these are the kind of things that you want to have to put a little flavor and, and put, you know, some color and flavor into your adventuring again it can't all just be there's a random encounter get out your dice all right why are these creatures you know why are these creatures here what are they doing in this piece of the forest why you know do they live here what are they you know <coughs> does it mean anything um were there any signs or you know that's the other thing too were there any hints or signs that they were around um there are a bunch of spiders on this list uh, I'm going to want to look and see if they're not the types of spiders, like a hunting spider, isn't going to have spun big webs. So the, the lack of webs in the trees um, isn't necessarily an anomaly when I'm talking about a hunting spider. But if I had some sort of spider that tended to spin big webs on the random encounter table, then I would expect to have to describe as the players are passing through that region the fact that there are occasional spider webs up in the big trees and you, you know and you notice you, you know that these are just things you see in passing just as you're doing you know as, as you as you're doing descriptions so just creating these encounter tables will help me as a dm better provide the color commentary to the players as they're traveling through a region even if they never have an encounter, all right. So that so there's there's that piece of benefit involved in, in in going through this exercise. So I'm actually hoping to get a little help from you guys because what I need to do is pare down this list 
um, or, the, or these lists, I should say, into smaller ones. And actually, the one I want to start on, and, and I'll explain why in a second, I want to actually start on the swamp one. And the reason I want to start on the swamp one is because uh, I'm in the middle of putting together an adventure package. I have the major encounters all defined. I'm, I'm in the middle of the scripting of it now. Um, but it involves the players going into the swamp uh, on their way to a lizard folk village that is in the middle of the swamp to pick up something from the lizard folk chieftain and return it to their base of operations where one of the uh, senior members of the of the Fey Council that managed that basically oversees the Fey Wood uh, is waiting for it. And I've already given them this explanation that the that the fen the fens that they're you know the, the swamps that the uh, lizard folk live in is an area where, where the nymphs won't go, you know, where the good fae won't go or can't go, you know, it, it, it's, it's just been, you know, polluted beyond their ability to happily survive there. Um, and that pollution happened, again, 2,000 years ago during the, during the Big God War. Um, it's never fully healed. Um, there's all kinds of nasty, dark, evil creatures in the swamp. You know, so the so the good fey don't go there. I, and I, by the way, I need to be careful about using the terms good fey and evil fey. Uh, one of the tenets of this game, and I was actually in a discussion or, or doing some uh, discord back and forth about this this morning. Good and evil in this world are extremely subjective. All right, if you are a human pioneer in in the Feywood, or if you are an elf from the Feywood, or you know, most likely a dwarf, you know, or any other of the creatures, but that are going to band together to, to be your, your typical quote-unquote good party. The reason you are good is because you are uh, brought up to follow a certain set of social and societal norms that involve cooperation, that involve looking out for your fellow folk, um, offering help, you know, and that sort of thing. And, and if you tend to follow those, then in your culture and society, you are good. And things that go against that are evil. On the flip side, if you are an orc and your culture has been scrapping around for a living in rough terrain, you know, that's sparsely populated or, or sparsely vegetated and food is scarce and, you know, any kind of resource is scarce. Um, and, you know, and you need wood, you need wood to build shelters and cook and cook your food. All right then when you get to the edge of the forest and see a nice big tree that'll that'll provide all the food all of the fuel and firewood and building material that your family needs to get by and you go to chop down that tree the elf who suddenly appears that says you can't chop down that tree that's a beautiful tree all right to you the orc that elf is evil okay <laughs> all right because that elf is keeping you from doing what you need to do to, to support you and your family. All right, so, so good and evil are very subjective things. So when I say good fey and evil fey, uh, or good fey and bad fey, I mean, it, it's kind of subjective. Now, having said that, the reason there are bad fey is because gods whose, again, whose purposes tend to lean towards selfishness and destruction have, have taken some of the original fey and have twisted, altered them, morphed them, whatever, switched them around uh, into nasty, vindictive, selfish, bullying, quote-unquote, evil creatures. Uh, but again, they're only evil to people that are on the other side. All right? The, you're, you're, uh, the gremlin doesn't see himself as evil. The gremlin doesn't wake up and say, I'm going to be evil today. All right? The, the gremlin says... It is in my nature to, you know, to be bully, you know, to be to be a bully and be selfish. So that is what I'm going to do today. 
All right, so that's that's kind of the the approach I take everywhere here. Uh, but I digress. So swamp encounters. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, five, six, seven, eight, nine, there are 29 things on this list. All right. I want at most 20. And I do not, and I, and I want them to have some variety, and I don't necessarily want them all to be, again, mandatory combat. So, but, but I also do want them to be interesting. All right, so a couple of quick things, all right. The main encounters in this, you know, that, that this, that these, you know, that, that I'm building around here already involve boggards. So I know there are boggards in the far, in, in the, in the swamp. All right, I have planned encounters, in fact, with. Boggard Scouts, Boggard Warriors, and, and a Boggard Swamp Seer. The bo uh, by the way, the Boggard Swamp Seer is actually going to be potentially friendly. But since it won't be the first one it, they meet, th there's a real possibility that, uh, that that the party will open fire on it before they realize that it, that's not necessarily what they want to do. And just out of curiosity, we're gonna we're gonna point out that if I do throw in more of these randomly, you'll notice that since my party is a first level party right now, that single boggard swamp seer that they're going to encounter, if they do end up fighting it, it's gonna be a reasonable fight for them. Um, when they encounter the two Boggard Warriors, that is going to be a nasty fight for them. Uh, the two Boggard Scouts, I think it's actually three Boggard Scouts, but one of, or two of them are toned down. And because they're toned down, that actually knocks them down a little. Um, you know, that's, so that's, that's, that's something else, by the way, that's a possibility. Um, and, and, and we'll, we'll show you how that works. Um, in fact, let me show you real quick how, 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 how you can play with some of these things and then tone them down. If I jump across to my major, to my lookup table, um, and I take something like a Boggard Scout. What I can do... And there are quick, quick and dirty um, methods for doing this. I can actually create two variants of of, of, of any creature in this table. All right, a, an elite, you know, a particularly strong version of whatever it is, and a not so strong version of whatever it is. And, and if you follow the, the PF2 guidelines for creating and making something elite or making something weak, what it basically does, elite raises it a level and weak drops it a level. So if I have an encounter, so now that I've done that, if I create... I just did that for Boggard Scout, didn't I? So, if they were two elite Boggard Scouts, that would be severe. Normally, it would be moderate low so I, I i can play and and i and, and actually in the real encounters i kind of mix and match these to to get a little more fine-tuned for first random encounter i wouldn't mix and match them um for just to make it easier i would i would keep everything 
and simple, and they would encounter just one or the other, one type or the other. <coughs> so if I find something that I really like, but I think it's too strong or a little too strong or a little too weak, then I, I do have the ability to play. And eventually I could even come over here and create the elite and weak versions of every one of the critters on this table just to have a complete table over there and I'm I, I won't, I'm not going to bore everybody with doing that here but that becomes a possibility so I can I can tune some things what I would like the, the threat levels to be again I don't want any extremes under any circumstances I don't want any severes I don't think in a random encounter table because again a random encounter table especially when you, if you think about when you use these or when you see them if they're walking through the forest for a day you know if it's going to take them five days to get somewhere all right and you and you want to break it up somewhere then you can throw a random encounter at them during the day that just becomes their encounter for the day and as long as it's the, it's the only one they really have then when they're going to get they'll make the camp somewhere They'll get their night's sleep, they'll make their morning preparations, um, and, and they're fully restored. They got all their spells back, they've had a chance to do some healing, all that kind of good stuff. Um, if you throw a random encounter at them in the middle of the night, depending on how they've set up their, unless they've set up their watch schedules to account for it, which they can easily do, um, Encounters in the middle of the night can be particularly nasty, especially if they've already had something else happen during the day. Because they haven't refreshed their spells, and they haven't, you know, done all of the healing necessarily, or, you know, finished all of that up. So, random encounters against a party in the middle of the night are often against a slightly weakened party in the first place. So, that you wanna, so I need to keep that in mind. Again, my objective is not to kill them with a random encounter. I mean, it, it's to make the, it's to make the game interesting and keep the action flowing. Um, so I probably don't want any severes in in this table. If it, if it was severe, I would be planning it. It would be a planned encounter. <coughs> Which, by the way, is something else you can do. Um, I, the the first encounter of my of the last adventure I ran my guys through. Um, was with a bugbear thug on the road it played like a random encounter but it wasn't a random encounter it was something i had built into the into the adventure all along it was going to happen all right there were no dice rolls the only dice roll involved in it in fact was uh was as the thug was sneaking up on the guy standing watch you know was was the detect you know is he detected or not um, that was that was the only random factor in that whole encounter. Like I said, it was going to happen. Um, but you can use it once you've set up an encounter table like this. You can use that table as a guide to help you with with little encounters, little planned encounters like that too. So it, it's another reason to have them, and it and it's another reason. One one again, my long term goal is to publish um, the Feywood as as a you know, a region to adventure in with a lot of tips and tricks for dungeon masters. Um, because I, I do want to have information in there to help relatively new people, you know, you know, people, guys that people that are experienced are going to take, would take, take a book and skim through it. And they remember where all the important tables are. I mean, it's, we all do this. Any of us that are experienced, uh, gamers or, or DMs. You know, the, the Pathfinder 2 rulebook is 640 pages. You force yourself to read through it once to make sure you got everything in there. You remember where all the important tables and lookups are, and that's all you ever look at again, and, and you're happy. If you're new to the game or to the hobby, you're, you're going to want to keep going back, and, you're gonna, and there's times when you're going to wish, you know, okay, I wish they told me a little more about how this works or how to do this or how to, you know... So, so I'm I'm trying to address that as well. I mean, I, I I'm not going to just have these these tables sitting in an appendix somewhere. There's there's going to be text around them that actually explains, um, you know, the the mindset behind random encounters and what you can use them for and and how you can use them even in planned 
in, in planned areas or planned work. Pardon me just a second. The ragweed is still going. Uh, you remember where all the important tables are. You're supposed to remember. <laughs> well, e either that or you find a good website and... Uh, Oh, look at that, a new Firefox. Not now, thank you. Either either that or you find a good website that you know where you can find all the tables and look them up quickly and easily as, as well. Uh, Archives of Nethys for Pathfinder. D&D um, &D Beyond for D&D. &D. You know, but, 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 but again, the point is, you know, the experienced DM knows, you know, Know, knows how to recognize the fluff that's in the book and, and, and knows where the important bits are. But somebody just starting out who's never dungeon mastered before, all right, even if they've played a lot, even if they've experienced, you know, random encounter, all of a sudden now they're faced with the first time they have to create a random encounter. How do I do it? What's what's the mindset? All right, any 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 of us again that have that have gone this route have done it and you know the first ones you did were terrible. Uh, yeah, D20 PFS, uh, PFSRD for Pathfinder as well, yeah. Um, yeah, there, there are good sites. Uh, with Shadowrun, I memorized like 10 weapons, their stats and ranges, and knew what page of the book the range table was on, yeah. Yep. Um, so, yeah, so, so anyway, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to actually develop this stuff with a mindset. Um, with the hopes of actually explaining that mindset and, and helping somebody new get more familiar with all this. So again, I'm digressing again. We're an hour in and I haven't put a single thing permanently on the table. So here's my first question. What do, and, and I'm going to bring up, just in case, I'm going to bring up the... Pathfinder books so we can take a look at these things if we need to. Most of them are in the first book, so if I need the second book, I'll bring it up. Alright, what are these creatures, and what are they like, and do they really belong? I, m I might still need to trim some of this list. Some of these might not belong. Um, in the forest. Now there's a few that I know are going to be there. So I will include those. And in fact, I just realized I missed one. And I'm going to need to put it in my other table as well. Sleeper Jaw, which is a homebrew version of an alligator. And I know they exist because I wrote an article for them in summer camp. So I know two of the creatures I'm going to have in here. And a marsh alligator is just is just the textbook crocodile. It, it just happens to be called a marsh alligator living in the uh, living in the swamp. And the sleeper jaw is a special version of those. Uh, I will also add that I do already, well, I'm going to put them in the table, but I already do have a planned encounter with a an alligator built into the adventure that I'm working on right now. Um, quick quick side story, my first playgroup has gone through that uh, adventure, and um, they're, they're, th th this alligator attacks them from underneath the water using its ability to be extremely stealthy when in and underwater. Um, they are in the process of trying to cross a small channel in the middle of the swamp. 
that is about four and a half feet, about a little, a little over four feet deep in its deepest. Uh, this party includes a dwarf, a gnome, and a halfling. The dwarf can barely cross um, at at the deepest point if he turns, if he tips his head up and. You know, and, 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 and stretches on his tiptoes. He can keep his, his mouth or, and mouth and nose above the water. Um, the the gnome and the halfling... Oh, and, oh, there's a goblin as well. Sorry. Um, they don't have a chance. All right? They're, they, well, they could swim if they want. Uh, but they took the other approach, which is to have the elf and the human... Or the elf and the half-elf, I should say, um, piggyback them across. So the half-elf monk loads the cleric drone, uh, cleric gnome rather, up onto his shoulders, and they step into the water, and they were the unlucky ones that triggered the attack. <coughs> uh, the the last chance perception rolls had the or initiative rolls had had the gnome beating out the alligator. All right, but the alligator beating out the monk for for the I initial strikes. So the gnome sees the alligator breaching the water just before the just before it strikes, and he immediately and successfully attempts an acrobatics roll to throw or to leap to to throw basically throw himself off the gnome the monk's shoulders and onto the far bank. Um, he passed it spectacularly, landed on his feet, and and did what this gnome does all the time. This, by the way, this this cleric gnome, the, the guy is playing him as as a a cleric that's wandering around, trying to experience as much as life, which is which is what gnomes do in my in my world, trying to experience as much of everything as possible. He does not consider himself an adventurer. He has attached himself to this bunch of adventurers because they're a fascinating lot. He wants to see, he's always heard about adventurers, and he wants to see how they work and what they do and how they work together and all that kind of great stuff. Uh, the reality is he is the cleric for the party, and he works like the cleric for the party. But but he doesn't see himself as, as an adventurer. So his first thought is to run for cover, and then as soon as he gets cover, he turns around and comes back and helps. But uh, but he does that, and then he basically leaves the the monk in the middle of the water to start fighting this alligator. Um, fortunately, al alligators are nasty in this game. They, uh, if they succeed with their jaw attack, their their follow up attack to that is to attempt immediately attempt the death roll, because a successful jaw attack automatically includes a grab. All right, so the so the first draw attack basically is it, he's 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 got a, he's he's got the he's got the monk around his waist, and and he and he starts to try to take it all take him off his feet and 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 death roll him. Um, it failed the death roll, which frees which frees the monk, and and once that's done, now everybody just jumped on the alligator and wiped it out. So. <laughs> um, that, by the way, was a party of five. So if you notice, that would have been a trivial encounter for a, for a party of five once they were all working together. Um, but for a brief minute, it was for a party of one. And <laughs> the alligator, one-on-one, -on -one, the alligator should have won. Um, but it was a fun it was a fun encounter because uh, mainly because of the gnome's action. You know, you know, he and he pulled it off. If he had failed his acrobatics jump. Uh, I'm not sure whether I would have had him land in the water um, and have the alligator go for him then, because he was more bite-sized. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm not sure how that would have played out. And and I'll have two more chances to find out. I have two more play groups that have yet to go through this. And one of those play groups is the party of four, and the four are a half-orc barbarian, a halfling bard. A goblin alchemist and a halfling druid. So, I think I, I think in that one either they're going to be swimming, in which case one one of them is going to be bite sized, um, or the poor barbarian is going to have to spend 
um, it, it was definitely going to get involved because he's going to have to ferry the other three across the river or across the channel um, one at a time. Or maybe two at a time. I might have him, you know, if he wants to try two at a time, he can try two at a time. But then his hands will be full. Uh, so I have a feeling that one is going to end up turning out quite comically. Um, I, I do write all these up, by the way, in After Action reports, so people can uh, follow along. If you follow my world, you'll see the published pu After Action reports and, and see how these peop how these folks do. And I, I do tend to uh, I, I report the facts, but I will I will flower them up a little bit to make them interesting reading. So anyway, what else should what else should bad should we have our parties encounter? when they're walking through a swamp. Uh, and I assume you guys can see this list. If anybody has any suggestions, what would you like to see on the list? We've got How about I know one thing that's that, that really wants to be there. How about a Fen Mosquito Swarm? What do you think? Should there be mosquitoes in a swamp? Leeches. Yeah, definitely leeches. Um, so we do have giant leeches. We have two kinds of leeches, actually. We have giant leech. And we have... Brood leech swarm, which is a very high level, so I might not might not go with that one. But uh, yeah, assassin vine is good because first of all, you don't want it, all of the threats to be from animals. Um, I was thinking of throwing a fly trap in there too. By the way, there is a uh, snapping fly trap plant. Um, constrictor snakes, um, could be, who's bothering me now? I'll get to that. Um, I do have vipers in here. There is a ball python. Let's see, is he in this book? I think. thinking about that oops is there anything in here that isn't necessarily dangerous <coughs> because again these things don't need to all involve fights they might just involve challenges for example i could put a couple of snapping turtles in a challenge channel they're not going to necessarily kill the snapping turtles, but they're going to probably want to figure out how to go around them. Um, yeah, that's that's another possibility is to is to, is to include, especially in the swamp. And why am I putting these guys in the road encounter table? Um, come on, guys, you're supposed to stop me from doing things like that. Um. Yeah, I, I could I could certainly inc in include trap type things. Um, so yeah, something like quicksand, just for variety. That that's an interesting one. Now that one obviously is not going to have numbers in here, but I I do have information on that that I can go and get from somewhere else. Um, so I'll throw that in. Are there any potentially friendly encounters here? Not with the boggards but there could be with the lizard folk. So do I want to throw a lizard folk scout in here? Let's say yes. They're looking for a lizard folk village and they don't know exactly where it is. So if they randomly encounter a lizard folk scout, it might actually be an opportunity 
Th or actually, this is the kind of situation where it might be good to um, to have them. Uh, you know, if they're really lost or they do they're doing something really silly, I could I could have a lizard folk scout show up and help them. Uh, so it's not exactly a random encounter, but it's something that's handy and ready to go. Um, yeah, the horse Artex sinking into the swamp, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly, that's another thing. The Lizard Folk Scout could tell them, you know, hey, be careful about such and such up ahead, if, if that's the way you're going. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, there are still one or two things that I could even put in. These are Boreal Wardens, by the way. This is kind of the uh, Pathfinder version of a Treant or an Ent. Um, they come in, the, the Warden is, is the lowest level or the, the weakest flavor of them. Uh, there are definitely trees in this swamp, so I could have, um, although I've, I've left them right now for entirely in the forest, I could have one of them wandering around as well uh, and for that matter some of these other animals some of the simpler animals could too if you notice I kind of trim this out to the to the really nasty stuff um, giant frog is another one again it might not attack them and if so it, it's just an obstacle uh, a lone hag in the middle. Yeah, I mean, again, but hags... Ha I don't see a hag as a random encounter for a first to third level party. Um, if I built something around a hag, yes. Or, or if they were higher level, then, then yes. Um, I did think about that. I mean, the, 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 obviously, this is not the exhaustive list of every creature that could possibly live in a swamp. Uh, you'll notice these lists stop at level 4, and even the level 4s, there aren't that many. Um, that's another one, by the way. Again, they don't necessarily want to mess with it, so maybe they maybe one of these lands in camp and they just have to stand very still for a while. Uh, <laughs> um... Giant otters, I see, is another possibility. Um, yeah, I get that. It, it's not that kind of swamp. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm sure I can just, yeah, I can, I can transfer a lot of these things over. By the way, how did the? Uh, yeah, that's what I figured. So let's see what this ball python looks like. Oh, do I have vipers and giant vipers? Do I have both of them in there? I know I have viper in there. How did I not have giant vipers in there? See that? Gotta miss, miss, miss things all the time. Giant Viper is a second level critter. And let's put the ball python in there. could be a stand-in for an anaconda. They might have an anaconda in there, too. I'll look in a minute. Uh, but the ball python is a first level. That means I need to put 
put them in here. not using any of these information so I don't have to worry about it there and the giant uh, Viper was a three so let's see what other snakes do we have created Oh, yeah, there's the anaconda. You see the, yeah, see the eight, an eighth level. I'm not going to throw an eighth level creature at him uh, as a random encounter here. Um, so they did. So a anaconda was there, but uh, it's just a really big, nasty version of the of the python. So we'll we'll go with the python from on this random table. That's interesting. A creature grabbed or restrained by the ball python attempts to escape. The effect of the DC of the escape, or the DC of the escape check is increased by two. That would have to follow a wrap in coils. Oh, and that's oh, that's where then the constrict comes in. Okay, so so we have the creature is grabbed or restrained by the python's jaws. So first it, it first it reaches out and it and it bites, and when it bites, it grabs. When it Yeah, yeah. So the grab, the grab happens automatic. If the jaws succeed, the creature is grabbed. On its next attack, it would then attempt to wrap in, wrap in coils. Um, the ball python moves the creature into its coils, freeing its jaws to make attacks, and then uses constrict again. So it's so once the thing is wrapped in coils, it is it is still it is still grabbed. Um, or restrained, depending on, on size. Um, and every round there would be a... Oh, that's interesting, because now it changes to a DC for constrict. It doesn't need to make an attack roll. Uh, the creature has to make a fortitude save, probably, to avoid getting crushed. Um, and if it tries to escape, the creature can react with tightening coils to suddenly change that DC-17 to a DC-19. That's interesting. <laughs> but it could only do that once. So yes, that could be a very nasty fight. Uh, have I ever played Elder Scrolls Oblivion? No, I have not. Uh, what else do we have here? Let me go back a little ways here. Uh, thinking Amazon of Piranha. Yeah, no. Um, I, I, I think we, le leeches, leeches, and alligators in the in the river are probably enough for random encounters. Uh, how about a shambler? I I love shambling mounds. Um. Anyway, in Oblivion, there are these plants in the Oblivion planet that look like big yucca plants. They swipe. Um. Yeah. Um. There's actually there 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 are similar plants to that in the in the book somewhere. Um. 
saw saw not sawgrass or something like that. I, yeah, they 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 exist. Um. So so anyway, what did, what did we decide we need a shambling mound? Uh, do they call them shambling mounds? And they might simply be missing again because of their level. Um, if I go to uh, here, for example, and I look, their plants. Actually, I think they're in the second book. I think that was one of the things a lot of people yelled and screamed about when the first Beast Cherry came out. They were one of the things that weren't in it. That, Oh no, there it is. It is there in the first book. It is a level 6 creature, which is why I don't have them. Yeah, I could scale them down, but I can really only scale them down from 6 to 5, and even that's a bit high. I mean, I could really scale it down, but then it starts to get silly. Um, might be interesting. Um, if I if I double if I double scaled it, well, let's see what they look like. Uh, yeah, let's come back to here. Okay. So it's level six. Page two ninety. Let's see what their stats look like. All right, so if I scaled it down twice, and even that makes it a level four, I'd have to scale it down three times. That would knock its perception down to six. It's athletics to 10, which isn't bad. Not very stealthy, although 18 in forest or swamp, so that would, that would help. Um, it would lose most of its strength bonus. Its armor class would go down to 16. It's immune to electricity and resists to fire. I'd leave those numbers where they were. Its hit points would go way down, of course. This might be, you know what, this might be the situation where it is time for, because you're right, I mean, these, the, I love these things, by the way, they're, they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, what I think I, I need to do with these guys, what I ended up doing with zombies in my very first encounter, and that was, um, I, I created a child zombie, uh, which was essentially a weak, a weak, one, a one level weaker zombie. But it could move a lot faster. Uh, anybody that's played Minecraft will understand and appreciate the uh, the the child zombie uh, and how obnoxious and annoying they can be because they're a lot faster than their other counterparts. Um, so let us, for the moment, stick in here. Call them Im immature shamblers or small? Are they just small or are they immature? Do they grow? We'll call it immature. Plant. <coughs> now the main one is a level six. Let's make this one a level three. And I'm gonna have to I'll, I'll, I'll have to customize the uh, stats for it. Because I can do that. Because it's my world and I can do whatever I want. So let's put an immature shambler in there. Right, 
by the way, once once these things are put into this list, then then we can randomize the list and, and do other things with it. Um, did I ever get the mosquitoes in there? I did not. Can't have a swamp without mosquitoes, right? See, I'm coming up with a lot of high-level guys in here, so but that's not necessarily bad because, uh, in fact, let me do this. I'm going to say that the giant dragonfly, I'm going to put him down here for a minute. Show you why. <coughs> there are going to be some of these things. Where the idea isn't to defeat them, the idea is to avoid them, or or let them pass, or let them go. <coughs> Dazzly Cat, you're going to need a bigger island with a volcano and four small ones. Uh, start uh, start to plan what you need. We'll we'll manage it. What else do we have here? Yeah, baby zombies, my greatest nightmare, zippy little nippers. Yes, they are, aren't they? Well, that's what I created in here. Um, you know, there was a, basically there was a, fa a, far a farm family that unfortunately got hit by zombies. Um, and they had kids. So when the party got there to deal with it, you know, you, you had you had mom and dad being your typical slow-moving, um, you know, shuffle after the bed guy type. Uh, zombies and then they had the little kids that could run <laughs> this 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 surprised the party on two levels first of all they also had to deal with the fact that they were going to now be hacking and chopping at kids of, of course they're dead kids already dead kids so um So anyway, um, things things that they just plain want to avoid. Uh, I'm gonna have to look up brood leech swarm, but wait and see how nasty they are. They're in book two. All right, so we got the giant leech already. How big is the giant leech, by the way? Oh, it's only a medium size. Okay, it's not that big. Five feet long. Okay. How would you like to walk through the water, and as you, you, you wonder why you're having trouble climbing out of the water, and it's because you're dragging this five-foot-long leech along with you that's attached itself to your leg. Brood leech swarm. The swarm itself is large. Um, oh, we're talking we're talking about a, a channel that is actually wriggling and writhing and churning with with these leeches. Ooh. <laughs> DM stretch, oh hell no. <laughs> when they gather in sufficient numbers to swarm, they eschew the health of a, uh, the, the stealth of a lone leech's feeding methods in favor of swift and merciless feeding. In these situations, their mild venom can affect much larger creatures than their usual prey. Uh, I see an eek, an oh hell no, an ooh. <laughs> Well, this, this this would be a level four. This would definitely be a one to avoid. Now I can throw it in there as as a ra again. These are randoms; they may not come up. I can put it in the table, and and it would be a you come to a channel, and this is what you see in the channel in front of you. You know, in, in, instead of instead of still calm, you know, but but dark stained water, you can actually see it. This, this sea of bodies, of, of, of leech bodies, wiggling and writhing and moving and, and all of that. And what do you do? 
and and if they don't say we start walking up or down the channel to find a better place to cross then <laughs> if that's not what they say then they deserve what they get um <laughs> Let's see what what does these what do these things do? Blood draining bites. Each enemy in the swarm space takes two d six bleed damage and is exposed to brood leech swarm venom. Uh, there is no attack roll on that. All right. So, in other words, if you step in, then you're taking that damage. All right. There is not an it's it, it's an action for the creature, but but it there there's no um if if you don't get across in one round <laughs> and you can't because once you hit their space you have to stop. Um, and now let's see. There's a poison involved, which will make you clumsy and sick and slow you down. interesting how do you fight them all right they're weak to any kind of area damage salt will hurt them any kind of splash damage will actually hurt them more because they're all over the place uh, they resist bludgeoning piercing and slashing so you, you can't stab at them you can't smack a hammer at them Basically, what you need to do, or they're, they're weak to these things, or they're weak to those. So yeah, th this, is, this is basically the solution to this is throw a fireball into them. Um, or, or, or have your alchemist just start throwing acid at them and, and, and let them dissolve slowly. It doesn't have that many hit points for a, 40, for a fourth level creature. And even its armor class for a fourth level creature is a little bit low. So, so, yeah, they're easy to see coming. They're easy to avoid. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Pardon me. This, they're, they're, these guys are more like a trap than a than a creature. All right, because there it is. It's in front of you. Do you really want to walk through that? And if the answer is yes, you're going to take a lot of hurt. Um, if the answer is no, you can just go somewhere else, or you can, because it's not going to chase you or follow you either. I mean, they're they're in the water. Um. So so. I I, I don't mind putting them in <laughs> into a random encounter table. Um, they would get a little note though explaining explaining their use. Um, but we're going to put them down in the to be avoided category as opposed to the to be fought category. Um, there's, so that, that, again, that's what, what I'm trying to set up here is that there want to be like four or five of these things. I'm even going to color code them. This is four or five things that we don't want to necessarily fight. We we just want to, you know, we, we, we might need to deal with them, and that dealing with them might be just to, to be stand, stay still until they go away. Um, you know, or 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 whatever. Some of these other ones, though, these these are here because. These are going to be nasty. These are going to attack. Uh, I'm going to put the Lizard Folk Scout. Uh, the Giant Frog might be in that category, too. The Lizard Folk Scout is a different problem again. Um, be 
because the Lizard Folk Scout, they want to interact with, but they don't necessarily want to kill. So I want to give him a color code, too. Uh, but I don't know that I'm going to have five of those. So the, the things up in this main category, and, and I'm, I'll probably move these. You know what? In fact, let's just move the Lizard Folk Scout to here. And say... The things in the top part, these, these are things that are either going to, that are going to attack the party. If, if, if they come up in the encounter, there will be a fight. They will start it. All right, so, so that's what the, the, main, the main bunch of these will be. But again, I don't want them all to be that. Um, can anybody think of any other passive traps like quicksand that would happen in a, that we could have in a marsh? Uh, or a swamp. I mean, I, I, it's already covered with, again, canals of, of, uh, not not canals, canals, but channels. You know, of, of water like by bayou kind of things. Some of them, some of them wide, some of them not so wide. Some of them just a foot or two deep. Some of them three, four, five, six feet deep. Uh, so I already have that issue in there. Um, although, you know what, it may be... ...worth putting in as, a, as an explicit encounter hazard. And because one of the possibilities for... ...you know, and, and make a note that if, if this comes up, then... ...there's a, a chance that one of these other things is involved in it. Um... We did want to throw that guy in there, right? Trees and plants with long the uh, trips on vines. Well, that's the assassin vine. Um, what do we know about the assassin vine? Book two, page 26. Let's see, trees, plants with long long needles, sharp thorns that are, that are poisonous. Let's look at the assassin vine. Um, detects a creature within 20 feet. Causes vegetation within 20 feet to writhe for one round, turning this area into difficult terrain. When a creature starts its turn in this area, it must attempt a DC 20 reflex save. Otherwise, it's slowed. Not a critical failure, it's stuck. Um, and then once it's done that, the vines themselves have a 10-foot reach and do bludgeoning plus grab damage. And once grabbed, then we can start playing constriction damage. Again, this constriction damage, you'll notice, again, does not have an attack bonus. It has a DC. So once you're grabbed on, on subsequent rounds, it constricts unless you make a save. Lorraine, how you doing? How's it going? Yep, you made it by... 10, 15 minutes. We are coming up with a random encounter table for a swamp uh, in a level 1 to 3 area. So, yeah, Assassin Vine definitely goes in there. We're, we're definitely going to have these guys thrown around in there. But I've, 
got them in there. So, what else? Oh, I was gonna look up this blood seeker. Page forty-two of book one. Sounds like something that belongs in a swamp. Oh yes. Oh, is this my favorite little sturge? Yes, it is. Okay. In level in in, in AD and D second edition, we called these sturges. They are one of my favorite critters. Definitely one of my favorite critters because these guys they they fly up, they latch onto you with, with barbed they basically stick their legs into your skin and the legs are barbed. Right? And then they stick their, their proboscis into your skin and start sucking your blood out. If you rip them off, it does extra damage. If you notice, attach. When a Bloodseeker hits a target larger than itself, its barbs legs attach it to the creature. This is similar to grabbing, but the Bloodsucker moves with the creature rather than holding it in place. The Bloodseeker is flat-footed while attached. If the Bloodseeker is killed or pushed away while attached, um, the creature takes damage, takes bleed damage. So once they've attached, you can rip them off, but you'll continue to bleed. Uh, un unless you get medical treatment. And all it, all it takes really is one, one leg attack to, to for that attachment to take place. Um, what other damage? Oh, and then they start blood draining. Once, once it's attached, we, we start playing the blood drain, uh, which is another 1d4. And the blood seeker gains hit points equal to the damage dealt. So they're harder to kill while they're feeding. Oh, I like these guys. Yeah, we're definitely throwing these guys in. Uh, I had a campaign. Um, the last campaign I ran was a second edition campaign. And I, I did a random encounter with these guys uh, against that party. But I did it. It, 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 was, it was a teach the party a lesson. They were taking too long you know how sometimes parties end up in in analysis paralysis you know and and they're you know the the monster is coming at them and they proceed to spend 45 minutes deciding how to fight it all right well when when i hit them with the sturges which are essentially these guys um the the, the encounter started with you know that this swarm of things comes in and you, you, and you are, are attacked by them. What do you do? And they started immediately with the, oh, well, maybe we should do this, or maybe we should do that, or maybe... I, I had a clock running, and every three, three real-time minutes, if, if, they didn't, if, if they weren't moving the action, every three minutes, okay, and now there's one on you, and now there's two on you, and now there's one on you. Well, after the third time that happened, they realized that they were kind of in the hurry, and then they started dealing with it and, and they they were not very happy at the time but uh but after the fact they they appreciated it and they said it was actually a lot of fun to because they because they got the panic <coughs> because there were about 50 of them in the swarm so if they just stood there they were they were going down um so yeah these these guys are definitely going to go on the list And by the way, how many of these would we need to put on the list? Let's see. Two, three. Let's put four on the list. Just for the just for giggles. Notice all these other guys, they're probably they're already good enough fights. The the Python well, I wouldn't have two Pythons. So so the Python is a minor encounter, you know, and, and easy to beat for a higher level party, but that's okay. Uh it's still there, and if it hits them in their sleep, it might be a little more challenging. Um, 
I need a couple more low-level things. Um, we see a lot of twos and threes. And we've got the bloodsucker in there, but what else do we have that's low-level? Snapping turtle. I'm going to put the snapping turtle in more for color than... Uh, again, because they have no reason to go out and attack the snapping turtle. But, but, it, but it's just a little more example of life in the swamp. Uh, the same might be true for the giant frog, which I have put in here already. Um, gotta get some leshies in here. Oh, I want to look up this fly trap too. 160. Oh, there's another happy looking plant. Okay. Oh, another one with 10 foot reach. Ha ha. <laughs> it's got piercing leaves. Interesting. Oh, I guess it's counting those. Those are the leaves. So there's a snapping fly trap, and then much later on, there's a much larger giant fly trap. Interesting. So there are a possibility. We almost got this table done. Do I want to throw some Gripplies in here? You know what? Let's throw in some Gripplies. Gripplies are essentially uh, tree frog kind or um, salamander, and I don't mean the flaming burning kind. Uh, in fact, actually, the Gripply Scout might go down here. You know, they, they have no reason to attack Gripply Scout. So that's that's good. So that, that gives us a little variety there. Again, they might learn something interesting from the Gripply. Because uh, the Gripply just want to live and be left alone. They're not necessarily out to attack anything and everything they see. Uh, we don't have any spiders in here yet. We need to have spiders. There's got to be a spider. <coughs> Uh, what's going on here? Let's see. Uh, yeah, steep slippery banks with water at the bottom. Uh, yeah, th those are the kind of things you want to describe as, as you go. Uh, twig, vine blights, the third blight might be fun. Swamp. I'll have to look at that, my rain. Um, Lorraine, sick trees on the party. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You you were thinking D and D, but you know what? If if it's in if it's in D and D, it's probably in Pathfinder too. Although it might have a different name. Uh, what do you call art that is many painted tile? Mosaic, mosaic, yeah, that would be mosaic. Um, yeah, the hangman's tree, that's another one I like. Um, could I put them in the swamp? Yeah, I could. Um, scribe, I feel the timelines can be streamlined. I should be able to choose the ear of an event by selecting a drop-down menu that I populate. Yeah, well. <laughs> uh, the time the timelines and calendars are still works in progress, I think, Timmy will tell you. Uh, and not exactly, or not, not the current most 
uh, important focus. Um, yeah, there is a timelines update later in this year. Um, so we'll have to wait and see what happens there. Uh, blights were in 3E, D and D. Let's let's see. Is there anything called blight in either of the bestiaries? See if we can find anything called blight anywhere in the beast series. Is, huh? Somewhere in the oozes section, huh? Let's see. It's almost time to go, so let's let's look this up real quick and see what we can find, and then it'll be raid time. Um, I assume we're in the ooze section here. Let's see, carnivorous blob, verdurous ooze, gray ooze, slime molds. Giant amoebas, yeah, those are, alright, so those are all of the book two oozes, and then what's in the book one oozes? Sewer ooze. <laughs> Gelatinous cubes, ochre jellies, black puddings. All traditional names from uh, second edition. Uh, one, one on that list is called a swamp blight. DM Stretch said, "Did I did I miss it?" Uh, sewer ooze, gelatinous ochre, black pudding. What's over here? Amoeba swarm, giant amoeba. Check the link you posted. All right, we will do that. But is this a homegrown? Is this a homebrew or is it? Let's see what it says. Where is it from? And as soon as we find this out, who, who who's up to be raided, by the way?
Toblin is up to be raided, okay. Alright, I see there's a whole bunch of, of, of blights. Yeah, okay, don't show me this to me again. But where did they come from? Oh, they're from Pathfinder 1. Aha. Uh -huh. Bestiary 6. So, they'll they'll be coming. They're just not here. They're just not in PF2 yet. <laughs> okay. That's why I can't find them. Uh, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't exist. So, I will have to take a look at them again in the future. In the meantime, we are running over... Uh, and my music has run out. Um, why? I'm not sure why it stopped entirely, but uh, oh my god, I wish I didn't do that. I'm gonna wish I didn't do that. So let's just come over here. Let's just arrange our raid. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, we will be raiding, um, Toblin and his CD10 world when my keyboard catches up with me at least. Uh, video paused, continue watching. So I, I can get the music back if I want. Let's say yes. Not that it'll be on for long. Alright, slash raid. Slowly but surely this is coming through. CD10 Toblin. Alright, again, thank you all for coming. Um, hope to see everybody on Thursday at 10 o'clock. Normally I, I, I have in the past started at 9.30 on Thursdays. Uh, but that was so that I could pick right up from Shy Red Fox. Shy Red has switched her schedule around. So uh, since I can't start any earlier, I decided to move my start time back to 10 o'clock, which does leave a whole hour. Uh, if there's anybody out there that wants to squeeze in an hour stream between um, 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. Greenwich Mean, um, 9 and 10 Eastern Time, um, then you're welcome to do so, um, you know, and encouraged to do so. Like I said, I'd rather than leave a half hour spot that nobody would want to fill. I, I opened it up to an hour, um, but I will be here at 10 o'clock my time. And w unless something horrible goes wrong, I will be on my brand new machine. Um, <laughs> Isaac, don't tempt me. Yeah, you you could pop in there. You used to do you did Thursdays in summer camp. You could pop back in there on Thursday. Um, I will see everybody on Thursday. I'm sure I will see everybody in the chats on on other streams between now and then. Thank you all for coming. Let's get this raid started. And we will be raiding in seven six five. Four, three, two, one. Thank you all once again. Have a good day.